So in this section, we're going to introduce the Fourier series, and this is all about representing periodic signals by sums of sinusoidal functions. Uh, I remember when I first uh, discovered this um, in my physics degree, and I found it really quite remarkable and almost couldn't believe it. Uh, I, so I hope you'll find this also just as, uh, just as interesting. Um, the reason we want to do this, as noted here, is that um, if we can express a signal in terms of sinusoids, then it really facilitates our understanding and analysis of linear time invariant or linear shift invariant systems. So as a motivation then, um, think about differentiation. Um, imagine this quadratic function on the left-hand side here, or in fact it could be any more difficult analytic function. Imagine doing a differentiation. Uh, so if we differentiate a plus bx plus cx squared, we'd get something like b plus 2cx. Or if it was some other analytic, analytic form, there'd be some kind of rule of differentiation that we'd have to apply to differentiate. And we could well imagine some quite complicated expressions on there that might get quite difficult to analytically differentiate. Okay, but notice with the function on the right-hand side here, where we're using just a collection of exponential functions. Now, what about differentiating a function like that? Well, I hope you know that the exponential function is extremely simple to differentiate. You know, to differentiate a e to the qx, the, sorry, e to the qx, the e to the qx stays the same, and we just uh, bring down the coefficient of the argument of the exponential, so the q just goes into the front there. And the same is true for the other two expressions. So the exponential rx stays the same, and then the coefficient of the argument of the exponential, so the rx, the r part, goes down in front. Likewise for this term here. And then, so it's really easy to differentiate a second time. All of that stays the same, and we just again bring down that, that uh, coefficient, if you like, and so now it's q squared. So you could imagine that if I now asked you to do 100 um, differentiations of that function, you could quickly predict it's going to be q to the power of 100 a exponential qx plus r to the power of 100. You know, in other words, you can really see that, that differentiation becomes extremely simple if we're dealing with exponential functions rather than following other rules of differentiation, which could be quite complicated in general. So I hope you see here that use of different uh, functions can really uh, simplify uh, various tasks. Now, you know, differentiation is actually uh, an example of a, of a linear uh, shift invariant operator, but don't worry about that. That's not um, something for this module, but I'm just pointing out that differentiation can be simplified just by expressing functions, if we can, um, as exponentials. And so here I'm showing the third differential. You can see already the pattern that I mentioned is actually very simple. So in other words, uh, life would be a lot simpler if we only had to deal with um, exponentials. Um, and so this you should be familiar with by now to point out that for a linear system, a linear time invariant system, a sinusoidal function does very much the same thing that I've just shown you there with the exponentials and differentiation. In other words, it goes through your operator, through your system, and it just gets scaled. Just like earlier on, the exponentials were just getting scaled by a simple scale factor each time. Likewise, the sinusoid stays the same. It's an eigenfunction, stays the same, just gets scaled by the eigenvalue for that particular frequency of sinusoid. Okay, so that's the motivation. And now um, the point, the first point here is, you know, in the real world, you know, it's all very well showing sinusoids uh, do that and get treated in a very trivial way, but how often do we really come across pure cosine or sine waveforms? Well, this is the rather radical statement. We can represent any periodic signal as a summation of those simple sinusoidal functions. So any periodic function can be represented as a sum of sinusoidal waveforms. So this is the definition of periodicity. So whatever that function is, you know, it might look nothing at all like a sine or a cosine, but it can be periodic nonetheless, repeated from minus infinity to plus infinity, and it will have some fundamental period 
t0. So let's give you some examples. Uh, here I've got something that absolutely doesn't look like a, a sine or a cosine. I've got a square waveform here. Forgive the imperfection in the plot. But basically the function is defined to be zero over this period of um, minus pi um, to zero, that time interval. And then over the time interval zero to pi, the function is equal to one. And then that repeats uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity. So it's periodic. And here we've got the simple case of the period being two pi, because this is where the function is uniquely defined. So remarkably then, uh, we can make that very function just from sinusoids, okay? So let's see, I'm just gonna show how that looks and then we'll talk more about how we do it in another section. So here I'm saying f of t then, uh, if we plot the function is equal to a half, so f of t is equal to a half would be just a horizontal line at uh, on the y-axis there equal to 0.5, it'd just be equal to 0.5 everywhere. That's f of t is equal to half. And then we add on some amount, so it turns out to be two over pi, so it's roughly about two thirds, two thirds of a sine. And so you can see here that we've got a sine wave. Okay, normally sine waves go, you know, zero, one, zero, minus one, back to zero. If we scale it by about two thirds, then of course, if we're starting off from a value of 0.5, then it goes up to about 1.1-ish thereabouts, comes down, passes back through 0.5, down, dips negative, goes back up. So I hope you agree um, that if you add to add together the function f of t is equal to a half to that uh, add on that sine wave, you would get the function we see there. Then we can add on another sine wave, but now of a higher frequency. So we'll put the, this coefficient three in front of the t, and so that's going to give us more waveforms per unit interval, as we know already, and with just some different scaling factor, some different weighting factor, two over three pi. And so that's going to be roughly, what, 2 over 9, thereabouts, you know, consider it about 0.1, about, uh, yeah, about 0.1-ish. You can see that if we add on that kind of extra ripple at about the kind of 0.1 uh, level, you can see that actually, I hope you can see already, this is beginning to look like the square wave that we had there. So remember what that looked like. And you can see here we're beginning to get close to it. And indeed, if we keep going with this, um, so if we add on another sine wave of 5t with another coefficient, another weighting factor, a different amplitude, if you like, and then another one, sine 7t, again, with a different coefficient or amplitude, then you can see even more that as we add on more and more frequencies of these sinusoidal functions, we're getting closer and closer to that original square waveform. And so I'm showing that here. I'm saying that we're using um, frequency zero, which is actually like, you know, sine of zero is zero, but uh, the zero frequency for cosine is just a value of one. And what we're saying is that we take half, there it is, half of cos zero. So that's this. And then we're saying take um, two over pi. So that was about the two thirds. So that's this amplitude here of frequency one. Don't take anything of frequency two and then take this um, two over three pi of frequency three. So that's what we're showing there. None of the fourth frequency, and we'll get to explaining why that is in a later section. Um, and then we take this amount of frequency five. So that was two over five pi. And so we're plotting out there a series of amplitudes for different frequencies of sinusoids, which when we add them together, recreate or synthesize that square waveform. And so mathematically, what we're showing there is that f of t in this particular case of this waveform is equal to a half plus what turns out, in fact, to be an infinite summation of weighted sinusoidal functions of all of the frequencies from one to infinity. The summation of n goes from one to infinity. And then as that approaches, it approaches infinity, so that function would perfectly approach the square wave waveform, which is actually quite remarkable to add together these very curved functions to get a function that is absolutely flat and sharp at the edges.
Uh, here's a second example. Um, now we're taking, uh, effectively, it's a linear function, just this uh, f of t is equal to a half t. Um, but we're defining this, this linear function with a gradient of a half just over the period minus pi to plus pi. So overall period is capital T is equal to 2 pi. And then we're repeating this periodically from minus infinity uh, to plus infinity, as shown there. So can we create this function? And the answer is yes, we can. Um, so there is the definition of the function. This time we're starting off with just a regular sinusoidal function. I think it's of unit amplitude. So that's just your regular sinusoidal function from uh, minus one to plus one. And the, uh, the period there is uh, just the two pi. And so here I'm showing an amplitude of one for frequency one. Uh, then we add on another sinusoidal function, this time of a negative amplitude, so minus a half of the sine of the second frequency. So that has modified our waveform, as you can see here. It's beginning to push it into alignment with our sawtooth function, the, the linear function that we saw. It's also known as the sawtooth function. And then as we add on a third frequency, you can see already now it's getting much closer. And so we could carry on with that. I'm just showing it here for three terms, uh, but you could add on all of these terms going up to infinity. And so again, we're saying that our continuous time signal is equal to an infinite summation of weighted sine functions of all the frequencies from n equals one up to n is infinity. Um, so there I've shown it uh, as amplitude as a function of frequency, but just to point out here, I could also have represented that as a magnitude um, and phase, okay? So here, the magnitude is just taking the absolute um, value of these uh, amplitudes. So in other words, you just take all of the, you just uh, take the absolute values here, and so you can see that all these therefore uh, become positive values, and we get this kind of decaying a set of um, magnitudes now. Um, but then we could also talk about the phase. And so here I'm assuming uh, that core cosine function that we've talked about before, because from that core cosine, we can form sine functions. And so we know that if the first uh, term is just sine of t, um, then that means the phase of the cosine, cos t uh, minus phi, um, to turn that into a, a sine, we're just going to need a phase phi of pi over 2, because that gives us t minus pi over 2. Um, and so that's an alternative representation where we can say um, that, uh, that this function f of t is just a weighted collection of sines, or indeed we could talk about phase shifted cosines um, as an alternative. Okay, so what we're saying then is that for periodic functions, um, we have in general this expression, okay? And we'll go into this uh, in more detail uh, later on in terms of finding out how it works. But for now, in this section, I just want to give you these graphical demonstrations that this remarkably can work. We're saying that any periodic function f of t can be expressed as some constant function. There I've plotted the constant function. So this is for t is equal to two pi. So this is defined over uh, zero to two pi, plus uh, an infinite sum of cosine functions of increasing frequencies. And each of those cosine functions has its own unique coefficient or amplitude or weighting factor, whatever the terminology is that we want to use. Coefficient is by far and away the most, uh, uh, the more recommended expression, I'd say, but we can think of it in those other terms that I've mentioned. Um, so added together with all these cosines and all these sinusoidal functions. And uh, you'll find that if you add cosines and sines together, then this in effect is, is delivering a summation of variously phase shifted cosine functions, but we'll keep it simple and we'll just eliminate the phase consideration just by adding together cosines and sines, and then the various weighting between those two will effectively be giving us uh, just phase-shifted cosines.
Um, but anyway, I just want to present this in the simple form of saying that any periodic function f of t is given by a constant plus the summation of an infinite number of cosine terms and an infinite number of sinusoidal terms. No phase shift needed if we use this expression. Now, as mentioned, um, you know, periodic functions don't always sit in the interval 0 to 2 pi. They're going to be a varying fundamental periods. So to make that Fourier series expression more general, we're now going to introduce this scale factor omega zero, that uh, fundamental frequency that we talked about before. Um, and then that allows us now to no longer have this, these functions constrained to be over zero to two pi. But uh, you know, this could be say zero to 10, for example, and then We've got, this is the first uh, frequency, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three. And instead of these intervals being two pi, now they can be whatever we choose it to be here with our definition of t zero. So you can see that if we chose t zero to be two pi, then omega zero drops out to be one, and we've got our original expression again. So what I didn't mention on the last slide was that the summations of these terms, I'm just visualizing them fully here by showing the first three um, frequencies for the cosines and the first three uh, frequencies for the sines. So this is a uh, sine one omega t, sine two omega t, sine three omega t. And of course, hopefully the burning question for you should be, and we will get to it, um, how do we find those coefficients a n and b n and a zero, because it's those coefficients that will determine what is that periodic function that we are synthesizing by this summation. Okay, so in review then, uh, sinusoidal functions, I hope you can appreciate, make life simple for linear shift invariant systems. They just uh, get scaled. So again, think of that differentiation example when you're dealing with exponential functions. The exponential function is your friend when it comes to differentiation. So likewise, sinusoidal functions are your friends when it comes to linear time invariant or linear shift invariant systems. They make your life much easier. Fourier series, as I've just kind of illustrated here, uh, I've just begun to introduce it, actually gives us permission to express any periodic signal as a summation of those simple sinusoidal functions. Um, Okay, so I've given you graphical examples of adding together sinusoids to make all kinds of different functions. And in gold text at the bottom here, I've mentioned what I hope you should be uh, asking yourselves, which is how much of each sinusoid do we use to synthesize or to reconstruct or to make a function? And so we'll be dealing with that in the next video. Thank you.